Here you go. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, here we are. Um, we uh, are happy to be here. Um, happy to see you all are, are here and checking us out. And we're going to be doing some feedback today. With me, I have a special guest, uh, Victor Mori. Uh, Yo. Dear, dear friend and, uh, and ex-colleague, amazing guy, amazing artist as well. Uh, Victor, do you want to share a few words about you and what do you do and yeah, your whole spiel? Sure, man. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, Esben. Esben just like hit me up this morning. I was like, you want to hop on the stream? And I was like, well, why not? It's the weekend. Lightbox. I always love Lightbox, so it's good to to be a part of this and uh, reconnect with the community. I think it's really important for all of us, especially since we can't see each other in person. Uh, hopefully next year. Yeah. Hopefully next year. Fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, uh, like has been said, we used to be on Splash together. Uh, now, right right now, I'm working on um, Arcane as a concept artist. So excited to be able to share some stuff soon. Soon, TM when that comes out. Uh, that's why I've sort of been off the internets for like the past two years, I guess. But excited to share share some stuff after that. But thanks for having me, Asbin, and excited to get to it, do some feedback. Yeah, yeah same here. Uh, so basically, uh, I threw a link uh, to a Discord where people could submit their their drawings of like their best work. So that was the thing. You took your best work, you would throw it up in the Discord, and um, essentially you would be, uh, you know asking for critiques so we're going to be we took four pieces from that uh, and we're going to be talking and kind of like seeing what we think could be improved some potential that could be attained by pushing it further um, and maybe just a quick disclaimer like the pieces that we're we are going to be critiquing they're great it's just like what we're going to try to do is take uh, potential and seeing where we can kind of keep pushing it so hopefully this is going to be really helpful and uh, usable uh, information for when it is that you create your own art. Um, yeah, we were we were really impressed. Uh, Esmond and I were looking through them and uh, sort of put my stuff to shame from like back when I was in school. I was like, I was not at that, not at that level. Um, I think you can still dig up some of my old work in uh, ancient, ancient blogs on Google, but yeah, really cool stuff. So excited to be able to uh, give feedback on, give feedback on it. Totally. Yeah. Um... Yeah, um, I think that would be a good thing. I just saw in chat too that uh, there's apparently some uh, volume that's too low. It should be You're better much now. better now. Yeah, perfect. I can, I can okay, be better. Yeah. Okay, How's great. My volume so chat? your volume is perfect for it's me, good. so it should be really good for the for okay. the chat. But we'll just see. Um, so in terms of the Rene, in terms of the how many pieces we're going to be critiquing, we got we picked out four, and basically these four are four that we think has uh, some like they're really great uh, but there's some things that we specifically we specifically pick them because there's some things that we think that we can bring out that would be extra helpful for people so we picked four out of everybody that was or everybody who submitted their their drawings and these four four pieces that we think uh, there's something unique to them so there's some four different lessons uh, that we can kind of get out of this and yeah as Victor also mentioned, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for submitting your amazing work. It's incredible to see all the talent out there. You guys rock. Keep on uh, having fun drawing and just doing that. So how about we just uh, jump right into it? Let's do it. Yeah, I was going to okay. say, uh, for those of y'all who submitted, I'm really proud of y'all. I think it's super important when you're coming up to not be afraid to share your work and get that feedback. That's how all of us improve. Um, I would say that was the secret sauce to my improvement as an artist was to just fearlessly always be like, please tell me what I could do better. Um, it can be kind of scary at first when you're like, ah, you know, it's, I don't want to show this. It's not ready. It's not finished. It's like, it could be better. It's like, it can always be better, but this is how we learn uh, by having these conversations. So uh, good on everyone who participated and submitted stuff. There was a lot of entries. It's hard to choose. <laughs> yeah. We were like, oh, what about that one? What about that one? So um yeah you know if, if we didn't get to get to yours we're sorry but um we had to kind of limit them so we picked four um shall we just jump straight into it victor let's do it all right so we're gonna start with what maybe the z one we're gonna start with the z one 
So uh, this is the this is the entry. Uh, let me just look up uh, the, the name. The name that would be a yeah. good thing to do. Um, so if you just talk while well, I'll I'll look up the name here. No, uh, this was probably my favorite out of the batch. Um, we picked ones that we felt like sort of had a clear intention or story because I think in our line of work, what we're trying to do at the end of the day is tell these emotional stories through characters. And so a lot of the submissions were like really cool drawings, but um, it's not as useful for us to be like, well, you know, the anatomy or blah, 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 or you could fix this drawing. It's like, it's more interesting when you can plug your decisions into creating an experience. And we felt like this artist was really tuned in to uh, what they want the experience of this moment to be. Um, and we felt like it was really close. So we have, this is Emiru, am I reading that right? Yeah, you are. Shoo. Yeah, big fan of this one. I mean, the rendering's just like amazing. It's better than my rendering. Uh, <laughs> but, and and I was really impressed because this this one uses the background in a way that supports the main character. Like there's not too much detail in the background. It's very soft and ambient, smoky. Uh, which feels very Zed, you know, it's in the shadows, you've got the crows, instantly puts you in that atmosphere. Um, the colors are really well controlled and muted, the values. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in here that's really, really good and really close. Um, and so the stuff we're going to focus on today is what we feel like would take this to the next level. Um, and I think mostly, correct me if I'm wrong, has been we're thinking about maybe a couple drawing things and then talking about volumes. Yeah. So um, for this one, it's definitely volumes that we're gonna like, and that's like how form kind of are in, in 3D space, but also how light kind of hits, hits those forms. So that's a big one we're gonna try to, to do for this one. There's some, 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 uh, some, some drawing things, but I think uh, what we can try to do is if you um, uh, kind of explain a little bit uh, some of the things that you see, uh, Victor, sorry, other things you see, then uh, I'll start doing a little paint over, kind of explaining that uh, with paint as you talk. Sounds good. So for me, um, I'm gonna pull up Emeru's piece on my screen as well, so we can all see it. Uh, Esmond's gonna be doing a draw over. What I see in this piece is that potentially when the rendering happened, a little bit of flattening might have also occurred, and sort of the biggest. Um, like little moments of improvement that I think we see is this rim light, which is very linear instead of volumetric. I think that's a pretty common, um, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but it's definitely something that can be uh, improved on to create this illusion of volume that we're talking about, where right now all the rim light fits basically in this red line that I'm drawing. And while rim light is good for popping out the character, if it's too thin like that, it can be a little bit noisy and it can flatten the piece. And so what we're going to look to do is create, um, is create rim light that is more volumetric and goes along with the form of the character and has like tapers. So I think Esben's going to go over that. And then as well, um, maybe some volume on the front arm because it's so focal. And I think uh, while Esben's drawing, I wanted to take this opportunity to pull up some of Alex's thumbnails. I think Alex is one of my biggest inspirations for how he thinks about this really early on in the process. Um, you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll even zoom into these. Um, and the cool thing about Alex's thumbnails is that he is not rendering any of the detail in the beginning. He's only thinking about how light hits the form. And what that does is he's making sure that the volumes read super well. And so that way, once he does add all the detail, values, texture, uh, stuff on top of it, you know that you're gonna get something that feels fully fleshed out. And uh, I love how playful he is with light in the beginning. And it feels like uh, Emiru here has really thought out how the the light um, supports the atmosphere of this Z splash. Oh, I love that. Did you just hit that shoulder with some light, Esben? Yeah, yeah. That, that feels really good. Um, I think it doesn't take away from having the face in the shadow. I love that we have the face in the shadow, but having a little bit of light hit 
the top of the shoulder there gives us that nice pop of red and it invites us to come investigate and it like it just grabs your attention plus instantly we have that top plane of the shoulder um so that was really awesome um, that yeah that top down lighting very dramatic kind of like in this evelyn piece um and and as you can see like it's basically just a gesture drawing and then a light test on top of it and i think this is such an excellent way to start a painting i think alex he's um he paints light you know what i mean he doesn't paint things paints light on things and it it just feels so rich so yeah i love what you're doing there with the shoulder oh and same same with the mask hitting that top plane just thinking more in terms of planes uh instead of just the rim which to be fair like you know if i was to shoot reference of this i might very well have a very linear rim light but if i can turn in a way that all of a sudden i can catch some planes and create some interesting shapes, all of a sudden you can start to add tapers into your light shapes, which then create flow. And all that flow is going to just enhance visual experience that you have and your ability to navigate through the piece. Really good notes. Yeah, I agree. I think that's also like what, uh, that's exactly what I'm thinking about everything that uh, Victor is saying uh, is exactly that. I like, tried to kind of carve it out um, and think about where the, the light would hit the volumes. Um, and I think as, as Victor also said, like we want to still maintain this sort of shadow area with the face, kind of keep it uh, mysterious. Um, but how can we add in some definition on the, on the rest of the form so it feels very volumetric uh, while we still kind of do that? Something I love about what you're doing too, Esben, is as you're adding these light shapes, you're, th you're designing the shapes of the light as well. Like this shape that you just added is this triangular shape that points towards Zed's face. And it has a sharper edge towards the point, and then it diffuses out towards the uh, cloth. So not only does it describe material through the use of edges, but it creates this like soft to hard point which serves as an arrow compositionally leading to the face. And that's something I always try to think about uh, when I'm designing light and shadow shapes is not only the, the shape design of the shape itself, but also the edge design, soft to hard, uh, big to small, thick to thin. You want to constantly be thinking about how to create these sophisticated relationships from one point of the painting to another so that it's never, so that it never flattens out. And the way it flattens out is if you just have you know, one value or one temperature or one even shape. Um, so you want to keep it dynamic. And the way you have something be dynamic is it's one thing in relation to another thing. So really cool there. Loving those changes. Um, so when you're uh, like, if so, for example, uh, Victor, like if you're a new artist and, and you're still grasping the, the concept of of learning how to draw a light and, and forms and 3D perspective, like what is a good sort of thing that you can do in order to kind of like force yourself into that way of thinking? It's, it's tricky. I think the number one thing you can do is uh, do figure drawing. Obviously that might be a little bit harder in this day and age if you can't uh, gather around other people because of COVID or, or what have you, but there's a lot of really good resources online for figure drawing. And um, the, the cool thing about figure drawing is that you should always be going into it with an intention, right? Like in the beginning, maybe you're practicing your line work and then maybe you're working on volumes and then you're working line of action. And then eventually you work up to doing light and shadow values. Um, but whatever, you, you first need to sort of self-identify what is the thing I want to improve at? In this case, uh, designing light and shadow patterns. That's like specifically what we're talking about right now in isolation of other things, because the values were already solid. The colors were already solid. There was a lot of stuff that was already working really well. So here specifically isolating light shadow pattern. And then you go into a figure drawing session, you light it, look for good lighting, right? You don't just, don't always just draw the model as is. Like if the lighting is crap, then be like, oh, excuse me, do you mind if I change the light? I'm trying to create some interesting shapes and get a, get something interesting going on. 
Once the lighting is to your liking, because you have to design the lighting, then you draw and you look for those shapes, those tapers, uh, that value pattern. So in that case, that would be how you practice that specifically. As well, you can sort of look to artists that you feel like are really good at this. Uh, for me, it would be like Alex, it would be like Linedecker, it would be like Sargent. Let's see if we can pull up a Linedecker real quick and take a look at what he's doing with light and shapes. There's this one piece that I'm like completely obsessed with that I think is a pretty good example of this. Let me see. Uh, people are also asking what uh, Alex's socials are. Um, maybe we can drop that into chat one sec. Alex is not the most uh, available on social media, but he is very generous with his art station. I think he shows process and close-ups, so that would probably be the, the easiest way to find him. That's going to be Alex Flores. I'll type that in the chat. Yeah. One of many very talented splash artists. There's a there's a lot of people you can look at. Um, Alex is a, a personal favorite of mine, but uh, you can find this stuff, you know, Pan's work, Jen's work, Bo, etc. But um, yeah, while Esben's drawing, I'm gonna do a quick sort of red line on top of this line decker to illustrate what I mean. Um, every single shape in here is designed in a way that's super satisfying. Like down to the silhouette, which is like small to big, small to big, curve, counter curve. And then within that shape, right, we have this light shape, which like Esben's doing has this sort of sharp edge and then a soft edge. And he does those everywhere, literally everywhere. Like you see one here see one here and they're all leading the eye going up hard to soft it's really amazing it's like and so artists like line decker have sort of left this blueprint on how to be good at this through how awesome they are and um, if you know how to look for it you can then apply that into your own work totally but yeah, that's just a quick, quick little example there. While well, Esben's painting, that's awesome. Thank you, uh, thank you, Vic. Um, okay, I think this the light paint over is is pretty pretty at a pretty good stage to illustrate the point. Ooh, um, look at that! So this is just like a before and after. We'll just zoom in so we can kind of get the full thing. Turn it on and off. That's great. So, you know, if we think that the light is too strong, we can actually take, uh, take the opacity down a little bit of it. Um, but the value starts to merge a little bit too much in my opinion. But having something like this, it's like super impactful. You still keep that shadow mystic feeling to set of like him taking off the helmet, right? Uh, while we also have uh, a pattern that happens with how we read it. So if you squint your eyes, like everything that's in light starts to become that sort of shape that also Victor was talking about. Even the hair is making that sort of like is making a shape and the light is also like being very, very clear. Like where is it that it's coming from? Because here in what we're seeing is actually the light of the that is rendered on this shoulder pad indicates indicates that it's coming from uh, you know, from where we're kind of standing, coming straight on. So it's a front light. Um, this one is indicating that two, this one as well, as well, as well. So, but we are missing some of that front light a little bit, some places. So if this is a light, we can kind of use that as a key light. So we're going to turn some of those things, some of those areas down, um, and then make sure that the key light really gets to pop out the form. And then we can relax some of the other uh, things while still maintaining the three dimensionality of it. Um, totally. Yeah. And it adds so much, so much drama. It's really awesome. And it, yeah, like has been said, it feels motivated. It feels like it's consistent. That's one thing I've sort of learned is you can get away with murder when you're designing light, but you have to get the sort of logic of it to be consistent. Like if you make all light 
clearly coming from one direction and affecting all the forms in that direction, you can sort of, uh, not cheat it, but like, you can sort of play around with it. But it starts to break if, like has been said, like, he's fully in the dark, but you're rendering it as if there's this like weak front light that's only hitting the metals, but it's not really affecting the cloth or the face. Um, and so it sort of breaks the illusion and the immersion and takes the viewer out of the experience. I think oh. uh, in addition to figure drawing, something you can do if you're not as advanced at this, like Esben can just do this off the top of his head, but he's practiced so many times. Something that you can do and maybe should be doing, especially in the beginning, I mean, I would argue you can always do this, but especially in the beginning, is take reference. Um, uh, something I've noticed, it, it could just be a coincidence, but it's sort of a pattern that I've noticed is that uh, younger artists and students nowadays can like render the shit out of something. They'll really polish it, but yes. it's it's not referenced. It's uninformed. You're just like you're either copying someone else's rendering that's in a different lighting scenario or you're making it up. Um, and like the way illustration has historically always been is that you had to like grab a friend or do a selfie and wrap them in a cloth for a cape and, you know, sort of hobble together a little costume and then shoot a lot of reference and light it yourself. And even if you're not copying it one to one, that's how you find out how the light works, right? Or some people do maquettes with, um, with like Sculpey, right? If you're a sculptor, you can do like a quick maquette. Oh, hold this up. This is so cool. Uh, there's this one magic artist, uh, Victor Adami Minguez, which I love. And I always thought his stuff looked so, um, it had this quality where it just felt so solid. Like, and I never knew why. And then <laughs> on his Twitter, he'll share like, oh, I just did a sculpture of it and I knew exactly how the light works. And so you're like, oh, cool. Yeah. That's, then it's just a one to one, you know, um, or like this one. He just went outside and put the maquette in the light. And you're like, <laughs> that's, that's really genius. Cool. Yeah. I love that. And they're really cute and they're really well made. Um, I'll do one more because I really like this one. Let's see. Bone Crusher, where is he? Need to organize my ref folder. Good. Point is, he does, he does a ton of these. Oh yeah, this one, so good. The final painting, this is one of my favorite magic paintings of all time. And I feel like no one could have like invented this. I feel like you need to have that reference to know exactly like, you know, there's the skylight hitting the top of the underside of his jaw, but not the direct sunlight. Um, like the cast shadow that this piece of wood has on the tail. Types of little details are pretty hard to invent uh, unless you're just like a master of light. And it's just stuff that you get for free by having a physical object in space in the real world and, and shooting your own reference. So big proponent of that. Um, I'll pull up one last example. Uh, another magic artist, Kieran Yanner. I really appreciate. He posted one the other day. Let me see if I can find it. Yep. Yeah. So, and he, uh, Kieran is a is a lot more one to one. So I think that one really shows you the power of reference. Here we go. Look at that. I mean, he clearly chose a person with the like physiology of Ral Zarek. Like he cast the actor, so to speak. Like he found a friend that looks like the magic character he was gonna paint. He went through the trouble of finding the correct material uh, for his outfit. Like especially this satiny red sort of a cloth. And like, just look at how much work is already resolved in the reference stage. And then he, all he has to do is paint at that point. Which is, which is hard enough as it is, right? So like solving everything up front just pays so many dividends down the line. The better your reference, the better your final is going to be. Totally. Yeah, I think that is, uh, that's kind of it for this one. So I know we got three more to go through. Um, yeah, well, but, 30 yeah. minutes, that's the right amount of time. Yeah, exactly. So uh, 
just gonna do a last before and after. Um, so yeah, for this one, what we wanted to focus on was light, the graphicness of it, and the difference that that can kind of make. Um, and I love the idea of, uh, of showing like, hey, you can actually build it, take a photo, use it, and also show the examples of like, hey, this is our, something that some people are already doing and they can achieve really awesome results with it. So before and after with some light, I'm going to move Gorgeous. on to the next one. Boom. Okay. Which one, Victor, do you want to do? Part two. Um, I guess I, I could take this one. We could do the angel. Mm. That's the angel that I quite liked. Love that. Yep. So I'm mm. going to show it here in my screen. It is this one. I'm going to find the person who did it and just throw it in here too um do you want to uh, tell a little bit about what it is that you're seeing uh what it is that you love about it and what it is that you think can be pushed absolutely so this one called to me because it feels like uh it's sort of in the spirit of a magic card illustration and uh, those who know me know that i'm a huge magic nerd um it feels like it's pretty close to something I would see on a magic card and something that I would enjoy seeing on a magic card. It's got a really nice silhouette, sense of movement. Uh, it's this like beautiful heroic pose, uh, but it's also not like the, uh, the like intense foreshortening that you would find on like a splash. It's more like this, uh, this wide shot, which shows off the design and the character. I tend to like those sort of graphic silhouettes um, so the thing I'm talking about here is like, we have this really clear situation like this. With the knee out, this like nice dynamic pose. You need to it's zoom very... in, zoom in a little bit. Oh yes, because it is, thank you. Uh, it's a little small. Perfect, thank you. Just yeah, so thank you for reminding me of to... No worries. Um, and I love like what it's doing with the wing and the sword um there we go just feels really cool the one thing for me it's it's gonna be kind of similar to the zed piece where well not quite i think what i want to talk about for this one is the idea of value grouping and things reading at a smaller size so kind of exactly what esben said as soon as i do this i'm gonna see on the uh I want to see live how small it is. It gets a lot harder to read. And um, those of you who have played card games, you know that that's basically how small the art is when you're playing the game. And so one of the cool things that I feel like Magic taught me is the idea of having a really good value read at a small size. Uh, so what I'm going to do is pull up a couple examples of some Magic Angels that I feel like do a good job of this and sort of analyze uh, what it is that they're doing differently. Okay. Uh, the, the the chat is asking if they can see it a little bit bigger. We can, I think, blow it a little bit up uh, on my end here. Uh, one sec. I'm going to blow it a little bit up here so we can see what Victor's doing. It's going to be a little bit lower um, resolution, unfortunately. Resolution. That's yeah, okay, because uh, I'm talking about big shapes. Like, that's the whole point, yeah. is I want to talk about the big value pattern and the big shapes. So here's an angel by Chris Ron, uh, Gennara. And when I turn it to grayscale, and when I zoom out, you can see that from really far away, I can uh, I can tell what's going on. And that has to do more with like clever value grouping than it does any sort of details. Because what Chris is doing basically is uh, he's creating this, this ramp of value using the wings. That's like white. And then it like starts to fade more to gray. And what that does is it carves out the wing and it brings your attention in from the outside in. Then, you know, same thing on the other one. You have this big ramp of value. And then conversely, the figure has the sort of grouped clamped values of the face as like lighter value. And the body is like the darker value. But then he uses the cloth again as a light to carve it out. And this isn't like necessarily uh, as realistic as say like the Zed Splash, 
But what it does is by having these clever value groupings, right? If I'm like sort of simplifying it down to its essence, this is the layer that he's subconsciously putting on top of the painting so that from far away, you can, you can make out what it is from a really, really small size. And so it's almost like you're adding this, uh, this graphic two-tone layer, like just below the surface of a fully realized painting, if that makes sense. And so nice. that makes your it makes your piece pass the uh, the like one second test. It's like, do I can I tell what's going on in one second? And there's and a, then once oh go ahead go for it. Uh, there is also like uh, the other thing like when Victor zooms out essentially. Can you try zooming out a little bit on the screen? So what he checks yeah. is like it's like it's it's that read of like how, can I still read and understand the picture from this size? And a way that you can sh do that when you're sitting and painting too is like to squint your eyes. So if you see Victor and I sit and squint our eyes, we're yeah, checking. That's what we're doing. For, yeah, we're checking for that read. So if we're like sitting like and squinting your eyes, you really want to squint so you blur out all of the details and just see the big statements. Go ahead, exactly. Victor. Sorry. No, no, of course. And so this is sort of step one, and you can take it even further. Like a tool I really like in Photoshop is called Threshold. If you go to the bottom. It's under, um, I don't know what this panel is called. It's the third one. You go to it threshold. Yeah. yeah. And then you can sort of tweak this little slider around so that you only have black and white. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, as but some people call this no tan, right? Just the black yes. and white read of an image. Yeah, uh, I know June used use that a lot. Yep. Um, but like even on his piece without my layer over it, you can see that Chris is thinking on this axis where in black and white, I can make out the figure at almost any size. Um, and so, yeah, once you have that, you start to subdivide it into these smaller relationships where like within within the group of the face, we know that we're not going to go darker like here. This is a good time to talk about value ranges. So when I look at the face, the shadow is this value, which is a, um, it's actually a really light gray. And then the light is this value. Or this is like al almost a 50%, it's like 65. But this is the, uh, this is the value range of the face. And then if I go down to the armor, it has the value range of going this dark all the way to this light. And so these two having a different value range is how he describes, whoops, that's how he describes um, materials. There's a different specularity to the metal than there is to the face. And then if you go back to the cloth, you have this value to this value. So it doesn't go as light as the face and it doesn't go as dark as the face. It makes it very soft. And so it's interesting to go through and look at his, basically his groups and see which value range he's picking per group. Like once you have your uh, your big design, then you have your sub designs and your value range of each group, but he never breaks those rules, right? He never breaks that continuity within his pieces. Um, I, I think and this, this thing, is a, oh. go ahead. Sorry. A good, a, a good thing to add to when Victor says groups, it's, it's, uh, the value grouped in a shape. So it's in the, it's yeah. the groups in the shape. Exactly. And this is a big inspiration for me. Um, you can see it in stuff like, uh, let me see if I can. Pull up uh, an example. This is stuff that I think about for, for example. Where is it? There it is. Or Pike. Uh, overall, this is like a really quite a dark splash. I'm gonna actually lighten it a little bit so we can see. But um, I'm thinking in terms of those groups for. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna zoom in again. There we go. For the bone, like I basically I'm using the same logic that Chris was using over here for his angel. I was applying that to all the bone parts in Pike. Um, so like the bone will go all the way from this value to like this value, which is eh, it's a little darker than 50, but you can sort of see what I'm getting at is I try not to let the bone go darker than a certain value. And what that does is it pops out graphically. And so from far away, that bone reads from quite 
far off. Same with the um, the dagger and the list. And so it creates these and uh, it creates these like anchor points, which you can then use compositionally. Like my idea for this one was to have the white of the dagger, the white of the shark uh, jaw, and then the teacup as the three white elements. And that creates like this nice little triangle shape that keeps you moving around the composition. Um, and then the other sort of light uh, values were like the two windows, which are sort of meant to echo his eyes and make it feel like this very confrontational, creepy piece. Um, but that's just like some of the things that you can start to play with once you're grouping things graphically. So let's go back to, uh, sorry, can you remind me of the name on this one, Esmond? Uh, let me just find it one sec. Sorry, I was like just listening. Uh, this is Dan <laughs> Robin, uh, Rob, Robinettes. Dan Robinettes. Dan? Dan, Dan? Robinettes, okay. yeah. So I really like Dan's piece. Um, but yeah, if we look at it uh, in terms of values, it's good because the highest contrast is still near the focal point. That's a great start. But I wonder if we can sort of superimpose a value pattern that's going to uh, help with the readability. So I'm going to go over. And sometimes what I do, it's really uh, quite silly, but I'll literally like do a layer that's that's too much. And then I'll lower the opacity little by little to see if it works. So I just wonder if we can group the sky a little bit. This is so relaxing picture. I can just sit yeah. and enjoy this. Yeah, I'm just saying yeah, this awesome. Enjoy, my man. You <laughs> earned it after that Z. You crushed it. Thanks, thanks. So nice. here I'm concerned about making just groups. And, and it's um, it can look sort of destructive, but I'm going to massage it afterwards. But I think it's important to, this is another thing that sort of Alex showed me, is he'll do big decisions, just big, bold, like mess up your painting decisions on a separate layer. And then he'll erase out and massage out. But instead of doing like little noodly changes, you make a big, bold change and then uh, evaluate. It's like science. So we're doing this for science. 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 And uh, so when it comes to value patterns like this, the the only tool that you really need to know about what makes something readable was taught to me by my painting professor, George Pratt. And he said that a figure is either a dark thing on a light thing, a light thing on a dark thing, or a high contrast thing on a gray middle tone. Um, so let me just quickly demonstrate. You either have... So, um, so there's a question here from uh, Ray Rayello. Uh, saying, so each grouping will have their own value structure, question mark, um, and the dark won't be more than 50% different? Um, so this is actually going to sort of explain that. Perfect. The, the way this sort of trick works, right, is like, let me do three. Da, da, da. This is like a really fun concept. Okay. So you either have a light thing and a dark thing, a dark thing on a light thing, or a high contrast thing on gray. Those are basic, like, at, at the most fundamental level, those are the three things that your eye can identify as figures, as, as things, right? And so I like to simplify it down to this sort of basic level when I'm making decisions, because it'll help me not get overwhelmed. I think values are very overwhelming. And I, the, the more I do this, the more I realize the people who can control their values and limit the amount of values that they use often get the best results, which is really hard to do because when you're painting, you're like, ah, oh, this isn't quite feeling right. Like I'll add some darks, I'll add some more highlights. And if the highlights are more highlighty, then they'll be more highlighty. And it's like, that actually, it's counterintuitive, but that doesn't work. It's more about zooming out and seeing the piece as a whole and understanding the relationships of the values to each other in the universe of your painting. You have to take the whole painting into account 
and not just that shoulder pad, not just that one little moment. You have to sort of save those values for when you most need them. Another sort of example for this, which I had pulled up for you guys, uh, this is kind of saying the same thing, but I found it really helpful. Um, I wish I could credit who this was. I don't actually remember. I feel bad now. But I found this on the internet. And uh, it's basically this side-by-side -side comparison of like a painting that uses three values. Both the left side and the right side use three values. But on the left side, they're using all three values for all of the characters. So like the lizard has white, gray, and black. The girl has white, gray, and black. The background has white, gray, and black, right? Everything has all three values. Whereas the version on the right, um, the lizard only has gray and black. The rock is only black. The background is only gray and black. And what that means is you've saved the white value just for the girl. And look how much more special and important that makes her in the context of the composition. And I would argue that you're not missing out on any form. Like the lizard still reads, the rock still reads, the background still reads. But since you've saved the lightest value for the girl, you've created this immediate read, which makes her focal. Um, I hope that makes sense. It makes total sense. Uh, also, the, the chat is helping us out. The example is from Sam Nielsen. Yeah, shout outs to Sam Nielsen. Such an excellent uh, art professor, so generous with uh, information. I've, uh, I think I've watched a couple of his tutorials. Highly recommend checking him out. I think he's most famous for his color and light tutorials, if I'm not mistaken. But as you can see, the man has a lot of good ideas to share. And this is, this is just something I always come back to is like, you could spend all your values on every form or you can save your value and like a cherry on top, right? Like if you're making a cake and you, you save that cherry instead of putting the cherries everywhere, right? So now that we've <laughs> so done all this back, back, roundabout, back, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the thing's going to be looking. It's good because you're giving them you're giving them the mindset of like what is it that we're yes. looking for? What is it? Because when we're doing these sort of paint overs too, and when Victor, if you just start painting, I'll 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 give you some space yeah, okay. to ease in and ease into it. So essentially, when we're when we're doing these sort of paint overs, um, it's hard sometimes like to just like whip it out in like five ten minutes. It's like boom, here it is. It's like really hard to do so sometimes it's like we try to see we try to give you a principle of like this is this is what we're looking for this is the mindset and how we we try to push it um and you know the paint over might not like do that to a finished level but what we're trying to do is give you the tools so it is that you see what it is that we're trying to see and push it in the ways that we're trying to do it um so that's what we're trying to do uh, we, of course, are going to do the best what we, that we can with the paint overs. Um, it's just uh, the nature of the beast. Um, so what you can see uh, Victor do here is essentially that he's kind of like thinking about the different shapes, right? The groups of values. So he's taking the background right now and just simplifying it. And uh, basically, he's looking for the, the big shapes first. Um, and then, you know, as he would move further into the painting, he would add some of the darker values to, but he would kind of maintain it within the group. So, um, so right now he's looking for the read. He's like trying to see, okay, how good would this read be if I kind of like zoom it out and it's like tiny again? Like if we just discard the details, like what is the big structure? What is the big statement that's going on with this piece? So. Like, I really love what he's doing here with uh, lightening up the skin. Um, that especially feels really good in terms of just how it stands out against the dark of the of the wing. And um, it is just trying to find, like, how can you push those contrasts so it, it reads. So I think I'm at a point where I can sort of start talking about this. Uh, thanks, husband, for, for covering me there. Uh, nice. Just... Quick side note, because this is sort of important um, to talk about. Um, I'm not lightening the skin willy nilly. I think like representation is really important. And in this case, I would feel a lot more comfortable getting reference of, uh, especially if it's someone of, of darker skin. So I'm not just trying to like bleach her skin just because I'm, I'm specifically trying to do like a value pattern example. 
Um, I think if I was to paint a black angel at night, I would have that in mind at the beginning of my strategy before I start the piece, but I'm just reacting to the piece sort of as is right now. So I just wanted to have that, that caveat um, to sort of prove an example rather than say like, you don't have to like lighten dark skin. Like it's not, it's often not appropriate, but here we are. So the things I'm trying to think about from far away is I'm trying to get the angel's body to read against the wings. I'm trying to get her body and wings to read against the sky. And I'm trying to get her sword to pop out because it's her source of power. So those are sort of my three goals um, in this paint over. So now that I'm here, I think it can be argued that from far away, I'm accomplishing that. Here by like grouping the armor, I'm able to see the silhouette of her body against the wing. By grouping the sky, I'm able to see the wing against the sky. And by having a transition on the sword, I have the hilt as a light on dark, and I have the blade as a dark on light. So now there's two relationships on the sword, which makes it feel very important because the rest of the piece only has maybe one or one relationship going on. Um, and then, yeah, it's good because you've saved, you've basically saved the white for this glowing eye, which especially when you do a piece where something has to be glowing, I think a lot of people's inclination is to like color dodge the shit out of it. The real way to do it is actually to have a darker piece overall and then save your light as value. That's what makes something feel like it's glowing. Uh, not necessarily a lot of special effects. So now that we're here, um, I do, we have to sort of consider what was lost, right, in the process. Because what was really nice about Dan's piece is we have some really gorgeous rendering going on here, and it's supposed to be this nighttime scene. So it's like, does lightening it too much take away from that? And it's like, yeah, probably, probably it does. So this is the part where now that I have my clearly separated groups, I can start to massage and bring back Dan's painting little by little, keeping the new relationships that we've added. So I'm just going to take like a big soft eraser and start to gently massage back a lot of the detail. Knowing that the groups that I've made are coming through sort of almost subconsciously or um, they're happening in areas like the edge of the knee against the sky or the edge of the wing against the sky. These are going to be the important edges. Yeah, like here. These are going to be the important edges that create that feeling of separation and clear grouping. But then I can sort of, yeah, bring back some of that. And then here on the armor, now that I've grouped the armor overall, now I can bring back some of that highlight. And I don't need much. Why don't I even do a little bit less? You'll be surprised how little you need for it to feel sort of complete. There we go. And selectively, I'm bringing back that detail. In little areas. That feels pretty good. And then here I've uh, separated the cloth from the raven. I would argue that the raven was being completely lost in the value shape of the cloth. So I'm sort of taking artistic license to add a ton of atmosphere, um, especially on the bottom here where you don't necessarily want to be looking all the time. I can really soften out a lot of that stuff. And then have this nice foreground raven, which now pops. And then, you know, you could even argue that you could get like a, a clear silhouette of the raven, get a little bit of detail, edge detail that's instantly going to tell me from far away that's a bird, right? Totally. Um, Victor, we have a Mortas champion who's uh, asking you, who's your favorite uh, Magic the Gathering artist? Uh, it's like, oh man, I have so many. Um, the person who got me into Magic was Kev Walker. He's someone who works in acrylics, and I would argue he's probably the master of um, of readability. And uh, I think it's because he has a background in comics. I'm going to pull up some of his art right now. Uh, Kev is just, it's insane. And you know, because he's working really small. 
Like his paintings are not that much larger than my Cintiq screen. And he does these in acrylics. And every single one of his pieces just reads. It's a masterclass in uh, silhouette, in value grouping, in soft ambient backgrounds with like strong figures. Uh, and it just goes to show that you don't need all that rendering to get a maximum amount of impact. I think his stuff hits me the heart, like some of the hardest, and uh, he doesn't really go into any of the noodling. Um, and he's not afraid to have these areas of just blasted out fog um, or just ambient, um, yeah, just very soft, like suggestive backgrounds. Like this background is just a watercolor wash with like some little squiggly trees, like barely suggested in there. And boom, I'm in a swamp. Like how easy was that? Like. This man is just like an efficiency genius. So Kev Walker, definitely one of them. I love Chris Ron, which was the, the guy who painted the angel that we were just studying. Tyler Jacobson, Wayne Reynolds, Steve Prescott, um, Carlo Ortiz. I mean, magic, it, it's how I came up in the illustration world, right? Like the, these are my heroes. These are the people I look up to and I feel like I've just learned so much. Uh, looking at and analyzing and breaking down magic cards and why what it is I like about each of them. So. There is also a, there's a really cool uh, block um, that you can find online that's called Muddy Colors, where yes. a lot of like really cool uh, ways of thinking and the same thing that uh, Victor is also covering today are kind of being discussed in an article form. Highly recommend checking it out. Uh, Muddy Colors is a great little block to check out. So um, definitely not as sexy a paint over as Esben, but I just I was more interested in sort of talking about this idea of value grouping and value relationships as a concept. Uh, I'll leave it up to Dan to sort of uh, what's it called to apply that in his own way. I do think like sort of anecdotally, this can benefit from the same type of stuff that we were doing on Zed, where like instead of these like sharp little pink highlights everywhere we can start to hit like entire planes with light or like think about the volume of the wing catching the light in a shape. Um, and that's just gonna help with the readability, but um, from far away. And this is, a, this is a cool thing I also learned from magic is like, yeah, if you save the white for just the light source, you can then just use the color for the planes affected by the light. So like here, I'm just using the pink as uh, like the forms getting hit by light, but then I save the white for the source of light. And if you keep those two separate, you'll know where the light is coming from. Whereas if I use the white for the highlights, it starts to like break down and get pretty muddy, at least in my opinion. Whereas if you take it out, you're like, okay, this is the light source and this is what's being hit by the light. So you can sort of create this, this hierarchy of like, this is what's giving light and then everything is like getting hit by that light and then fading, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you mind uh, zooming a little bit out, uh, Victor, and then turn on and off uh, your uh, paint over and then Everybody in chat and everybody who follows along, try squinting your eyes. Like squint, look at it, and then you zoom even further out, Victor, and then yeah. see the read of like how much we're able to tell in terms of like, especially on the right side of the of the whole canvas, like that becomes a lot clearer. Um, so it, it, it really just is like this fundamental that like makes it stand out from a distance too. And especially what Victor is saying, like if it has to be printed on a small magic card, it needs to have that like punchiness and readability instantly. Exactly. That's sort of my test. Like something I do every time a new set comes out is I'll look at all the cards that came out. And the first scan I do is which cards do I like at card size? And the, the cards that don't have a good read, I instantly skip over because my eye just can't even tell what's going on. And then the ones that have a really good graphic read, I'll then go look up the artist profile and look up the high res, and then I can admire like the brush quality, the rendering, the facial expressions, like all the smaller stuff. But I, I don't even do that second step if I can't get past the first, first step. 
So this is basically uh, a lesson in that. Fuck yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Victor. That was, uh, yeah, that was of course. absolutely fantastic. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and thank it. you, Dan, for volunteering your, your beautiful angel. I think this is a, a really great piece, and I hope you uh, jam on it. Totally. Um, let's see. So we are right on time. This is going so well. Um, so smooth. Calculated. It's calculated. Um, <laughs> so, so basically what we're going to be trying to do now is we're going to pick another one. So we covered values in graphic read. We have covered light um, and shape a little bit too. Um, which one should we do the 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 fancy one or should we do the desert one we could do let's do the gesture one i like that one because again we can sort of isolate like the one thing we would push is that the one that's really fast yes you so fast it. <laughs> it's too so fast, fast. Too curious oh no is that does that mean that i have to provide the paint over for this if you can, while I rest my voice a little bit, and then I'll cover you. <laughs> Fair. Uh, we can also try to both like sit and draw, do some pushes, and then when you want to do that, Actually, then yeah. I'll make, no, no, wait. I'll make your yeah, yeah. No, no, it's genius. How about we both open it and both yeah. do a draw over to see how different people approach it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And and we're gonna like pick different parameters of the thing that we like. Oh, you know, it's kind of like. It's kind of what we're doing here is kind of like, you know, if we're in the kitchen and we are making a dish and then it's like, oh, yes. I want like I'm going to add a little bit more salt. I'm going to just make it a little exactly. bit more sweet or roast, roast the skin to be a little bit more crispy. It's exactly those <laughs> parameters that we're doing. Or if, if we're talking music, I'm going to add a little bit of bass here and, you know, yep. uh, refine this. This is what we're going to do. So um the next piece that we're going to be talking about here, uh, I'm going to find the name and make sure that we do a, a call out because we want to do proper. We want to give the artist, uh, there we go. Yeah, this, one, uh, this one was really impressive. Yeah, it was even, it was the first one that was like uh, put up to the channel. So uh, this is going to be a little bit hard for me to pronounce, but I'm going to try Man, Man, Mank, Manek. Um, something like that, but uh, this is uh, this is the one. Uh, I'm gonna just like highlight it here. Super awesome entry. Uh, we really loved the amount of detail that is already being uh, communicated. Um, so there's a lot of things that are already really working. So uh, if you had to pick one thing, Victor, that you would say could be pushed, what would what would be the thing that you're gonna be looking after in your paint over? Um, so for me. I think this piece sort of begs a gestural draw over because when I think of the flash, um, I had I had an animation background. And so I'm used to doing these like very gestural drawings and uh, thinking about line of action and sometimes even doing like smear, like smear frames, which are like in between frames where things will sort of blur because they're moving so fast. And uh, whenever I see a piece like this, again, I find it tremendously impressive. Um, but anytime you render something, it tends to sort of solidify it, right? Like if we're talking about the, um, the cooking metaphor, it's like if you overcook a cookie, it starts to get like hard and, and it, it doesn't have that molten center, right? And I think it's really hard to do, but I'm always curious to see if we can bring some of those animation fundamentals of like gesture and stretch and, um, like how to put it i'm not really sure how to word it but bringing keeping the energy of the gesture and the sketch in the final and this is tremendously hard to do i think um you said manic yes yeah, the artist I, I, I think that's how how um how you would pronounce it but yeah that, that would be my guess to pronounce it gotcha this wonderful artist, uh, I think, tried to do that using uh, blur, like motion blur, which I think is a good solution when you have to have this sort of higher fidelity, uh, more rendered look. Um, but a part of me feels like that can also be accomplished just in the drawing phase and in the shape design phase. So uh, what I'm going to be trying to do for this one is putting a gray layer over it and seeing if we can push the drawing underneath. 
Yeah. Um, also, what I'm trying to do is exactly what <laughs> what uh, Victor is going to try to explain with a different approach. Uh, I'm going to try to see if I can free transform it into uh, into into some of that. That's always harder because it's it is like a, a more fundamental push. Um, but um, you know, uh, it's two different ways of like. Often, if you try to do it directly in paint, it uh, it's it's hard, right? Because you are basically drawing and painting at the same time. So uh, when doing something that is more of a structural change, like, you know, anatomy push, um, then I definitely recommend drawing it uh, as well. It just, uh, it becomes easier, I would say that way. Um, but what I'm trying yeah. to do here um, is essentially also what, what Victor is, is, is talking about, um, which is like, it's also thinking about the flow of the pose. So I'm gonna to try to just uh, group this for a sec here. So um, there is this sort of thing, especially when we're making something feel dynamic or fake making something feel explosive or in your face, right? That's often what I mean when, when I say dynamic is, um, so there is this thing in composition that is whenever, let's say we have a, a frame here. So this is our, this is our frame. Um, whenever we have something um, that is even, um, then it makes us feel calm. It makes us feel uh, at peace, right? Like this, this is a, like horizon line. It feels very peaceful. But when, whenever we want to do something that is very dynamic, we tilt off the camera or we add very strong diagonals. So when you want to make something that is very dynamic then you want to stay away from things that are even or splits the canvas evenly um, however that kind of comes out so what i'm going to uh, what i'm going to try to um, show here is like so i'm looking also at the flow of of him so we have a big sort of flow line here coming from uh, the leg the leg right that's coming up to the face and then there's a really nice flow line here that's going out into the hand. I like that. And the other hand kind of going in, in here. The, the back hand is disappearing maybe a tad too much, but you know, I can, I can kind of sort of live with it. So I'm like, okay, that's a really nice, um, you know, it's, an, it's a nice flow. How can I, you know, the cooking metaphor, how can we add a little bit more salt? How can we make it more impactful? What are the parameters that we can tweak here? So what I'm trying to do and you know, uh, it's not done perfectly um, is I'm trying to take that sort of same um, line of action and I'm trying to um, to push it. So before, if we just take the line of action, put it up here, turn these off. So we're just trying to see before we have a line of action that looks uh, like this, which is again, fine, but like, how can we make that more dynamic? How can we add that? the direct, direct uh, uh, what's that called again? Uh, being diagonal. Thank you. Diagonal. Yeah. Diagonally. <laughs> gonna add more <laughs> of that. How can we make it more diagonal? Uh, I'm going to try to kind of do that in this sort of example up here where I take that sort of same line and I push it back. So the other thing that happens here too, is I try to, you know, we have something that's coming forward in space. So if this is a torso, we have something that's coming forward in space, right? Um, and then as it kind of moves back, we're gonna start, it's gonna start disappearing more and more into uh, the background. So it really comes forward and has that hyper uh, dynamic feel to it. Um, so let's try to see back and forth. And especially also when it comes to um, something that has to feel like if it's a, like, if it's like a running scene or something that has to feel hyper um, dynamic, uh, often what is used is like a one point perspective. So having all of our lines kind of lead maybe to a point, like maybe let's say we have a vanishing point here. Like we wanna kind of like, I mean, it looks like we're in space, so uh, we can kind of like Try to do something like Bro, that. we are in space. We are the in space. Floating in space. <laughs> what? Spo oh, no. Spoiler alert. <laughs> so let's see. So basically what we're trying to do here is like we have everything kind of like come uh, to this one vanishing point, right? Uh, and then 
emanating from there. So that's essentially what I'm trying to do with the back leg too. It's like, I, I wanna kind of push it further back. So we really feel that he's coming towards us. That's a lot of speed, it's hyperdynamic and it's, it's impactful. Um, Victor, do you wanna sh uh, share a little bit about what it is that you're seeing? Because I see that you're, you're doing the same push, but in line, so. Uh, yeah, let me, yeah. Let me do you wanna tell us about it? Oh, you're doing it in the painting, you absolute madman. No, no, but that's 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 good. Uh, I think we yeah we reached a lot of the same conclusions. Um, so I'm sort of gonna parrot uh, Esben here. Oh, I should have saved the original. Uh, I I got it. If you want to grab screen from me. Uh, no, it's okay. I, I have it. I have it. Gotcha. So we okay. Hold on. So, just so we can do like a before after. Edit. Uh, I flipped it just because I draw better on this side, but I'll I'll flip it back later. So we have Le Flash right here. And yeah, the, the first thing I did is kind of, uh, I think similar to what Esben did is I didn't do a liquify, but um, I did a transform skew to sort of stretch it out. To sort of stretch it out and get those really dynamic horizontals like Esben said, because yeah, for anything that's moving at that speed, the zippier the shape uh, subconsciously, it's just gonna feel right. So I sort of stretched them out Already we're getting like a longer, thinner flash. And then I put on this, uh, this blank layer and I'm looking to streamline it. Uh, and that's sort of, yeah. So I have this under sketch, just real quick, real loose. I'm staying really, really loose. Um, and my hand is moving really fast. I'm almost like flicking my pen so that I don't get into like, okay, well, here's the wrist and here's how that connects to the the brachialis majoris von vontificator. It's like, no, I'm just like whoosh, swishing around. And then once I have that, I'll like knock it back and uh, I'll start slowly adding the structure back, but very selectively and very uh, conscientiously so that um, I don't lose that zippiness and that freshness. So here we are sort of two passes in. I feel like I have something that um, feels really dynamic. And then it's going to be about how do I slowly bring the detail onto that without losing the energy that I've gained. Uh, but the biggest oh. things, like if I had to sort of analyze what I've done in the drawing, is streamlining the entire back line. Oh, I'm going to zoom in again. Sorry. I know I zoom out a lot. Here we go. Is this line of action? Oh. Here, I'm basically connecting his back and his leg, and that just gives me this like really forceful line. Um, I don't know if you guys have read the book, also called Force, uh, but they sort of go into this like getting these really powerful central energy currents through the figure to unify all the body parts because it's easy to sort of have too many limbs going off in too many directions. I'm not saying that's what the artist did with the flash. But as soon as you go from something more articulate to something more streamlined, you get that that really dynamic, punchy action feeling, right? Okay. So I sort of simplified that. And then I know that I have this arm, same thing, like counter curve. So I have one going this way, one going this way. The arm is going straight into the head like that. And then same with the knee, kind of have it. So it's... If you think about it, if you take out all the other pieces, it's about this type of flow. I have this, 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 this. It's like, feels very dynamic on, on an abstract level. I mean, we're getting probably too abstract at this point, but um, that's sort of the things that I'm looking for and thinking about. Wait, yeah, I absolutely love what it is that you did with the hand. Like, it looked like how the curve is continued up and it like really feels like he's kind of like, the, the hand is like cutting through the air as he's like moving forward. Super, yeah. super, Make super Make lots nice. of sound effects when you draw, it'll help. <laughs> but yeah, honestly, like really awesome piece. Um, but I think that we both agree very much like on, on love to see uh, how that could kind of be pushed um with uh you know with uh there we go with um with the pose right you really want to hone in get as much out of that uh that punchiness of that that run as possible 
um, but you know like the rendering and 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 that is is really awesome like you 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 know you you have obviously done a really great job it's just like how can we do this more and i think that's the biggest win that i see for this piece is there anything else that you want to um bring out Vic? something else you see um, for it um so just a quick sort of idea because i really like a lot of the work this artist has done with the vfx um i wouldn't say vfx are my strong suit i like to do sort of a more traditional approach that looks more like oil paintings and stuff but i think there's like some really cool like parallaxing and, and chromatic aberration and stuff i will say just from a logical standpoint the braider that his foot is making i feel like we can have some better storytelling there by uh not having it break towards us if that makes sense like the shape is really big towards us which makes it feel like he's going backwards almost whereas i think what you want is something kind of like this where the waves are behind him like he's coming forward right and then i think you can also have some of them sort of going back in space to show that he's he's been running and that gives us like a passage of time moving forward and then like the yeah the debris i think would be breaking off behind him rather than in front of him and i think little things like that can help because it's this piece is so much about the motion that I think it's important to get that stuff right. Get the trail. And then, you know, you can blur it. I think uh, one thing speaking about the, the VFX too is actually shape, the shape of the VFX, right? So whenever you use curves, it kind of becomes like a little bit, it loses some of the speed. So if you're doing something like this, like, uh, you know, like something that is curved, it like it looks like it's kind of like changing directions often and slowing it down. So if you have something that's like more straight, it like really adds and emphasizes that emotion of like you're going forward, forward, you know, like so the more squiggly and curves you add to the VFX, the slower uh, it actually kind of like makes the, the, the VFX feel. So you really want to make sure that uh, you you push that to kind of like be more um, more straight out. Oh, you thinking for like the lightning? For the lightning, yeah. Yeah, could be like, uh, and you can have it go thicker towards the camera to give even the VFX some perspective. Exactly, yeah. I'm trying to do the, this, the, the things as well there. Let's see. Yeah, that's a really good point. I like that. Sound effects. <laughs> Sweet. What did you do? Okay, let's see. Uh, well, try to see, throw in like a like a radial blur on this. See if ooh, nice. Good. Yeah, Very honestly, radial. the action lines, action lines. It's um, you know, it's it's pretty typical, but there's a reason they work. They really do work. Um, and even in uh, a lot of splashes, if a character is moving fast, you want to try to get a lot of the background elements to have that radial energy and that zippy energy because the flow of the objects depicted is almost more important than the objects themselves. Like, you want to get that flow coursing through the entire piece, whether it's the figure, the VFX, the background, everything should be going in that direction. And that's what's going to create that overwhelming sense of motion. Totally. Cool. Love that. Yeah, nice. <laughs> All righty. Do you want to do uh, like a kind of do a before and after on your paint over? Just do. So mine's show? not not much not much of a paint over. Um, it's uh, more you of have a to draw. zoom in a little bit. Can you uh, make it bigger? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. But yeah, also like this is kind of anecdotal, but for a character like coming towards the camera from a place, I like to have the foot just like disappear into this triangle. And you can pretty much get away with this, especially if you have VFX, like just have the VFX sort of obscuring where the foot would be so that you don't have to draw the foot. I found that like drawing the back foot touching the ground really like 
anchors the character in a way that fights the motion. Whereas like if you just have it sort of fade out and be the zippy shape that just disappears behind him, he's, he's already past it. He's like, he's beyond the foot. We've left the foot far behind where, you know, <laughs> it helps him Ooh. just come way forward. <laughs> yeah, just lose a foot, just lose a foot. Yeah, no, but I outrun your own feet. <laughs> there, there is this sort of like uh, thing where it's like it's either right after or right before. So right after yeah. it 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 has left the ground or right before it touches the ground. Those are the the two moments. Not when it is touching the ground, either or. It's like right before or right after. Yeah, I would agree. Um, sweet, hell yeah! I think we were like we saw a super eye to eye on that. We we're like, yep, yeah. <laughs> it's the push in. Um, in the post if if, uh, if we can so yeah back and forth here um, very nice yeah i think i lost a little bit of um of the vfx there was a nice vfx up here in the in the in the foreground yeah the like, lightning you know? yeah so but, i mean there's something to be said about having the lightning trail behind him as opposed yeah. to be in front yeah but he, yeah but maybe if if he is in space we can have the the stars like be little zooming uh, past yeah, like, like little Star, Star Wars, you know, like choo, 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 choo. Yeah. the Star Wars background sort of thing. Oh yeah, the hyper hyperdrive. Totally. Anyway, uh, but yeah, I think Very that's cool. that's what we would do in, in that sort of scenario too. But really awesome. I hope it was useful. Uh, oh, I forgot the 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 name here. One sec. Let's see if I still have it. Merrick Melik. Uh, yeah. Yes. I hope it was uh, useful. And uh, yeah, really awesome. But yeah, a little bit of the silhouette of the back leg and kind of thinking about those shapes would definitely help. So that moves us to our last pick. Do you mind if I do um, if I do uh, chat questions while you while you work? No, on the last yeah, one? yeah, go for it, go for it. So uh, so Victor is gonna be here interacting. So ask uh, questions. Uh, we're here for you guys uh, in this uh, period of time, so ask away. Um, then I'll start talking a little bit about our next piece. Uh, let me just find the person who submitted this and make sure that we give a shout out to them. Yeah, I also really liked uh, this one when we were looking through the submissions. Um, one of my favorite things about it is you get the sense that this person is thinking about the camera. Um, I think that's something we haven't discussed yet today is about how you frame the shot and i think illustration especially like for splash for magic for stuff like that you have to come at it almost like a photographer or a film director where you're trying to get the shot that best describes the moment and the emotion that you're going for and so so far we had like sort of a like a mysterious close close up on zed which was good because it was about like taking off his mask and sort of seeing his emo face through the ravens. Then you had the angel, which was like a bit of a flatter staging, but it was like the angel against the light of the sky. So it was this very like poetic, almost mystical, almost biblical feeling. Um, and then the flash, we were like sort of, uh, he was sort of coming towards the camera. We get the foreshortening and that communicates all the speed. For this final piece by, uh, what's the artist's name? Jip, Jip, but uh, Jip is also in the ch in the chat. Uh, Jip oh, draws. Great. Thank you for picking me, uh, Jip. If you don't mind, while Victor is also explaining, can you give me like the story? Give me like information about what it is that you want this picture to be about. What's the story? What's the feeling? Give me that information because then I can kind of target that feedback towards that. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Jib, give us the one sentence. You only have one sentence to explain your story. AKA, Azir takes off the mask, revealing that he was the king of Sharima all along. Like, just keep it short and sweet. Who, what, when, hit us with the, the elevator pitch. But um, yeah, we like this one because we get the feeling that you are trying to tell a story. Whereas some of the other drawings were really cool, but it would just be like a figure or a character or like a cool pose. But this one, I get the feeling that it's like, this is an important moment, right? You have specifically chosen this moment. We're looking up. We're in awe of this person who is doing something important or ceremonious or transformational. Um, so let's see if we can get the lowdown from Jib. 
sorry for putting you so much on the spot, but it's really going to help us. Um, so I yeah. hope it's okay. I, I will say just like as a general note, um, getting feedback in a vacuum, I would say is not very useful. I think it's important to know first and foremost, what you're trying to communicate and then tell people that like, for example, for the flash, like I want it to feel like he's literally running so fast that he's running through space. Right. Um, or for the angel one, it's like, um, I wanted to feel like this powerful, victorious, mystical angel, um, like use those descriptor words, because if you're like, how do I make this drawing better? It's like, there's any number of ways you can do that. Whereas if you know what you're trying to communicate, you can ask for feedback on how to get the emotion across. And I, I find that that tends to be much more useful feedback than just random generic because then you just what talk about anatomy talk about color i mean it's all important stuff but it also has to plug into your message so jib answered in the in the chat his name is rosin he's an adventurer uh, uh above that oh crowning moment of azir soldier going into his close guard oh cool so this is the moment where he's basically becoming a soldier or like getting knighted basically by Azir? Or like, is that kind of what I'm understanding? Yeah, I think that the thing that's a little confusing is that the knighting is often that there's another character in the shot kind of like knighting it. So it's like, it's almost like, I think it was more like taking it. It's like a reveal shot is maybe what I'm getting a little bit from it. Like taking off like that sort of mask, revealing your identity or, you know, like kind of like your, your you're seeing through a different lens or uh, since it's well, him, like removing it's, it or if, it's a, if he's going into Azir's close guard, I see that as like, or I understand that as like promotion, like he's being promoted to Azir's guard, but sort of gotcha. to Esben's point, I think it's a little bit confusing because he's on this random rock. Whereas like, I think it, you'll notice throughout the art and legends of Runeterra, all of the stuff set in Shirima is very ceremonial. You'll have rows of soldiers. You'll have, the sun disc in the background perfectly framing everything and all of the rituals and ceremonies are always like framed uh by like statues of the old shreeman gods or like stuff like that and so having him detached from that community from that culture from that time and place can make it a little bit confusing for us where we almost feel like it's the opposite where he's taking off the mask and like giving up his shreeman past to go live in the desert and be an adventurer but if you want it to be the adventurer who then joins the guard, I think you want to put him in that context. So I'm going to try... Yeah, he, re he receives the mask. He receives gotcha. the mask. So I'm going to try to do where... He, I'm going to try to keep as close to what it is that you already got, Jip. And then, um, you know, uh, we're going to try to, like, maybe change the location a little bit with, uh, I think, the stone. Because, it's like, if it is, like... If you're being kind of crowned into like, let's say you're, you know, being biased, you're like becoming one of his guards or joining that his army in that sort of sense, uh, maybe it would be done a place where a seer would reside, where I would assume like, I don't know, let's try to kind of put it in a, in a city uh, of some sort of Sharima. Um, so that's what I'm going to try to do with the paint over at least of like trying to change the location a little bit. So it's not just a rock in, in, in the desert right now. Very cool. So let's see. This is more about purpose dictating the piece. Yeah, Soapy Waffles, like everything in the piece should be about the purpose. It's, it's form follows function 100%. Um, and I think that's one of the things that is lacking the most, I think in more amateur work, in my personal opinion. I don't really look at the rendering and like any of that stuff until the story is clear. Once I see that someone's trying to communicate a story, that's when I start to take interest in an image. Um, and I think it's the same for the audience, right? For these games, for these movies, for these TV shows. Just a cool guy in a cool suit, you're like, you just don't care. You've seen cool stuff. You see cool stuff all day. You're scrolling Instagram. There's no problem finding cool stuff everywhere you look. But what captures us as humans is stories and emotional connections. And so having that clarity of the moment 
is what matters. And if you don't have that, you can't really, you can't really make the piece to an extent. Like, if you're like, hey, how do I fix this painting? I'm like, I don't know. What are you trying to say? I can't help you until I know what you're trying to say. Well then. So this piece already has a backstory. Yeah, that's why that's why we chose it is we got that feeling. We got the feeling that this that there was a story that Jib was trying to tell and so what we want to try to show in this demo is like based on your story what decisions could you have made differently to support the narrative and how can everything in the piece support the narrative. Uh, I think that's the magic. Ah, so cool, Esben. I already love uh, a lot of the changes you're making. Let me try to see if I can explain. Actually, I'm, I'll explain some of them a little bit later. If you can yeah. uh, have fun with chat, see what we can help, then we'll, we can go through the changes and I'll, I'll explain further. Um, how did you do the star for your perspective? I find a solution to do that, but Photoshop changed the tool. Um, did you use the brush, Esben, or do you have a... No, I have so, a, I have yeah. a, I have a, 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 a setting. Uh, I will just, uh, I'll, let me just find it here. One sec. So, uh, I have, a, there's a video on it. Let me just drop the link for all of you guys in the chat. So just give me one second. Let me just find it. Here it is. So this, uh, this, um, YouTube video is really good. I really liked it. I think they cover perspective really well and they give a little, uh, you know, a hint to how to kind of set up that grid that I did. Um, so it's just a setting you put. So I'll, I'll put that here in, in chat. So you have that. Nice. Thanks, husband. Yeah, okay. sorry. I didn't want to interrupt your flow there. All good. Um, but yeah, if you guys in chat have any questions for us, now is the time. I'll be fielding those. I hope this stream never ends. Oh, well, it does have to end because I got to go play some magic after this. And husband has to go to bed, right? <laughs> Yeah, I got after uh, the 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 what's it called? Uh, after the stream with Ross, I got to bed at three a.m. and I woke Ooh. up at nine. And it's been I haven't relaxed much of the day. It's been kind of crazy. So, yeah, uh, some crazy days. And there will be some. There will be another kind of. I'll be doing a a drawing thing in Magma Studio tomorrow. Tomorrow, as well, together with Pat. Uh, this man. This man is a hero. He is. Giving you all the goods. Oh, everybody's saying thank you, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank they you. They appreciate you. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. yeah. And if I if I can do a little plug, I hope that's okay. Um, there is uh, just released uh, the brushes I've been using for a long time uh, for sketching, but also for line decker studies and all that. If you're interested in it, um, you know, no pressure. If you don't, if you're not, totally cool. Um, but there, I, I left a link in the description. So for those who are interested in, in that sort of thing, link is in the description to the store where you can you can pick them up. So I think that's that's all for me. Nice. Let's see. Yeah, check those out, guys. Uh, a good brush can really change your game up. Oh, okay. We got some awesome questions rolling in. Let's see. Um, how can we improve splash art especially? I love those atmosphere and victorious feelings you guys make and want to work really hard on it. Um, for that one, I my personal approach is to look at a lot of films, film studies. Whenever you're looking at a movie and uh, you just go into the theaters and there's a moment where a character feels really powerful or heroic, I take like a mental picture in my head of like, is it an upshot? What's the lighting like? Where's the focal point? Uh, how did they make it and how did they support it so that this character feels really important at the time? Um, and I think if you study that or study it in illustrations or like the in the splashes that you like, which ones feel really good and really heroic and try to analyze what are the decisions? Like how do they use values? How do they use the camera angle, um, facial expression, stuff like that? What is a good way to come up with more interesting compositions that help push story? So that's a, that's a good question. I think in Splash especially, it can get a little difficult because at the end of the day, the character has to take up two thirds of the screen every time. Uh, so you don't have the sort of compositional freedom that you would 
in a movie or in a magic card necessarily like we always have to be able to see the face we always have to have the main character front and center but within those parameters i think you'll notice like there's thousands of splashes there's a lot of wiggle room within that space uh, and i think uh as ben you had something pulled up at the beginning of the stream that was like a quote from orson wells about restrictions is that right yeah yeah i can find it it was actually from a from another um it was from another uh lightbox uh talk uh by oh okay yeah yeah um but, but it resonated with me i think it's, it's fitting it's yeah it's orson will uh let me just find it one second um i so i, I took i took a screenshot of it and then here it is i, I got it here let me know when you can see it there it's we go orson yep. Wells. uh um the guy, uh, oh, I know it's. Oh, he directed. He, um, he, he worked. For, yeah, yeah, but uh, this is the. This is from the. This is from the presentation by Cole. Cole. His his last name is like Kolek. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry that I'm missing this right now. I'm actually a huge fan. Um, he works for Pixar, um, and he's a, an amazing artist. Um, Kolek, I believe his uh, his last name is. Um, anyway. It says that you, you can read it. <laughs> the, yeah. The enemy of art so, is the essence of limitations. And so what that means is like, you need to set rules and parameters for your piece to narrow down what it can be and what it should be. Cause if it could, if you just put everything in there, it's going to be a mess. And so you need to know like pretty strictly, what is the one single clear message you're trying to communicate so that you can make all these decisions that plug back into it. Yeah. See. Everybody's loving, loving the stream, loving what you do, Esben. Thank you. Will you come back to Twitch? Your streams are so interesting. Uh, I'm taking a, a break from Twitch. Twitch was really fun during winter break, but um, it's also a lot of work. Um, and I hope you guys appreciate, obviously, like what Esben's doing, but like, even if you just stream for two hours in a day, you're preparing like two hours in advance, and then you need to rest two hours after, and then you need to get up early tomorrow, and then you still have to go buy groceries and go to the gym and like hang out with your girlfriend. It's like, it just takes up a big investment of energy. And so can't really do that while I'm doing a full-time job, but maybe winter break or maybe uh, during a vacation, uh, we can hop back on and have some fun on Twitch together. But, uh, yeah, right now I'm just mostly focused on Arcane, and then when I come home, I just want to relax. What is the hierarchy that illustration pieces should follow in terms of how you guys create it? You mentioned starting with a good story behind it. That's a good, st that's a good question, the hierarchy. Um, so similarly to the quote about having limitations, those are going to be imposed on you by the product. Like if you're working for Riot and you're making a splash, there's a whole team working on this character. Like we don't invent these characters. There's a concept artist, there's a writer, a game designer. And so what those people are going to do is they're going to hand you the, the finished concept. There's a whole doc about how the character was made. They usually have three pillars or historically that's how they were made. And those pillars are basically their core identity. And so our job as splash artists is to communicate as much about the character and how that character is different from 150 other characters uh, as we can using the best possible shot that we can think of. And so that can that can get remarkably hard. Like speaking for myself, I know when I was working on Pike, I had a really hard time with my first thumbnails. I was like, ah oh, man, these all look like Zed or they all look like Talon or they all look like Nocturne. I feel like that the assassin coming out of the shadows, it's been done a million times, right? And it was only after a conversation with Jason Chan that he came up with the idea of like, what if Pike sank a ship full of captains and he's underwater? And I'm like, that's super unique because Pike is the only champion that can, well, maybe not the only one, but he's one of the only champions that can breathe underwater because he's undead, right? And so the setting really helped make that splash unique. Whereas if I just make him like jumping out of the water and cutting some guy in half, it's like, that could be any, any character. So luckily, what I'm trying to say is we have this whole support system of like people who have designed and understand the character 
And so we have this whole doc of like things we're trying to communicate about how to make it feel unique and make it feel like this experience, basically. Uh, but as students or as, as practicing artists, you have to set those limitations on your own work, right? Because you are not on the team yet. So like pretend that you are given an assignment of like, okay, I need to make this Ari splash, but this is specifically, you know, XYZ skin. This is her Elderwood skin. How are you going to make it different from every other Ari image that I've already seen, right? Uh, what is the story that you can only tell in Elderwood that wouldn't be the same as like Valentine skin or demonic skin? And so that's, that's where you're starting out. Um, and that's what you have to think about. Um, after that, obviously, you get into like all the fundamentals of art on how to make the image. But I think the more important or the more interesting part is the puzzle of how you're going to tell this unique story that fits the product. Uh, and that ultimately excites the players and makes them want to live that fantasy or, or buy that skin. Um, as been quick thing, sorry to interrupt you. Apparently, okay. the camera stopped working for me. Okay, let me just... Oh! Oh, whoa! What the... Uh, we're on it, guys. We're on it. Uh, we're on it. Here you go. <laughs> we, we fixed You're it. You're freaking Thank out! <laughs> Where's Victor? Oh, <laughs> I'm back, baby. <laughs> Alright, thanks, guys. Sorry about that. Let's see. Da, da, da. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. We have another question from Modern... Archeops, what's the main difference between MTG and splash design in your opinion? I know they are different, but I always tend to try and do both, probably from lack of understanding. Um, I would argue that like one of the superficial differences about magic and splash is just stylistic. Uh, splash tends to have a slightly more uh, anime influence, I would argue, than magic. Magic tends to lean more traditional fantasy. Um, and it tends to lean a little bit more photo real. Like if you think about it on a spectrum, it's not like 100%, but it's trending a little bit more photo real and a little bit more, um, what's the word? I don't know, less stylized. Whereas Splash tends to push shapes. Um, like I said, it has all sorts of influences between comics, anime, um, and games in general. So you're going to end up with a slightly different look. I mean, I've certainly put uh, this like for fun. I've made magic cards using the guard and honestly it works because I think with the addition of planeswalkers, planeswalkers are basically magic's version of champions, right? They're like main characters. Um, and I think in that sense, you get a lot more overlap. But uh, what magic has that league doesn't have is like spells, lands, uh, creatures, and those are going to look different because they have a different main character. Like if a spell is like lightning bolt, then you might have like a small mage in the background and he's casting a lightning bolt. And that's not going to be the same image as if you have a champion who uses lightning bolts, because then it'll be like the champion's the main character and then the lightning is going to be smaller, right? So like you're going to make the image different based on its function. And uh, so that's why those things can look a little bit different. And yeah, just slight stylistic differences. Camera, camera, camera. Uh, question for Esben. Did you work in your own studio when you did the pieces for Riot or did you go to the States? Uh, all, it's very, very, oh, there's not a simple answer for that. Uh, yeah, sorry. I kinda <laughs> hate you That's all good. Twister. No, no, no. I like it. I like it. Um, so the, the journey is this, uh, I've always kind of loved illustration. Um, always did something like similar to splash a little bit, but in my own sort of way. Um, and then when I was at six more vodka as an intern there after a year, we got Riot as a client and I was super ecstatic because I like colorful and stylized stuff. Um, and before it was uh, the work I was doing a little bit was more on the realistic side. So it was perfect. It was like a, something that I like to do and something that I excel more at. Um, and then, so the first splash was made in Six More Vodka. Then afterwards I was uh, being a, a 
alone in, in Denmark and uh, I did some splashes there. I had Victor to be my, my point of contact and art director. That for is some funny, time. isn't it? Like Which I was, was really your uh, feedback owner in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So on program, uh, Lissandra, you were, you were my go-to guy, my, my shield and my sword when I needed help, uh, which was awesome. Um, so Victor actually helped me out there um, with, you know, communication on the feedback and getting me set into the processes. And then, you know, after I had to vape, wait for my visa uh, for, I think it was eight months, eight or, or eight or nine months. Uh, while I was waiting, then Margo was working on splashes for eight or nine months. And then I, I moved over to the States and I was almost there for five years. And then now I'm, I moved back to Denmark because I want to be closer to family and family. Yeah, that's pretty Fam. much it. The fam. Yeah, I have kind of a funny story uh, when Esben started out. So yeah, he was in communication with me while he was working uh, from abroad. And I mean, the team loved him right away. Like super friendly handsome dude who draws like a god perfect fit for the team uh, i think your first one was like program lissandra the thumbnails were super badass awesome and uh me i was a little bit more green i had just joined riot as a little bit more immature i would say and so i tended to speak my mind and uh i remember as a like outsource feedback manager i was really trying to like defend Esben from large changes because Riot has this really bad habit of making really big changes like down the line. I'm like, no, 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 you give this man an assignment and then he's going to do it and then we're not going to change it. Like that's how it works across everybody else in the industry, blah, blah, blah. And so, but, you know, lo and behold, he gives these amazing thumbnails and then the product changes and we have to do these huge changes. And, um, and so one day I'm, you know, we have to break it to Esben. I'm like, Hey dude, like your thumbnails are really good, but we're going to need another set because X, Y, Z changed. And so we, we need some new thumbnails. And then we like end the call and I turn to the team. I'm like, I don't get this guy. Like we tell him to do a whole new job and he just smiles and, and he says, I'll do it. He's such a pro. And then in the back of the, the speakers, you hear like Esben, he's like, Hey, I'm still on the call. <laughs> and I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> All of this to say, dude was total pro, like didn't even flinch when we're like, start over. And like, for me, I would have just thrown a huge tantrum. Oh, I I, 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 I threw the tantrum after the call. I was like, what the? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, oh, God. No, it's, it's, it's such a bad like... habit of Riot. I'm always, I always feel so bad because we outsource with so many extremely talented people and I'm afraid of like, burning them out or burning those bridges. And so when we can't get our shit together on Riot's side, I'm like, please don't waste this artist's time. Like we were so lucky to be collaborating with them, but uh, it did improve over time. There was a lot of work done on that. Totally. It's, it's uh, it, a lot of work has kind of been put into uh, changing that. But yeah, it was really bad. A lot of huge changes, uh, way really too late. late in the, yeah. yeah. Or like Vane, I think Vane, they changed the uh, the design after you were done with the splash. Yeah. Crazy. Oh, well, that is probably is the one is. I hate. I hate the most from me. I was so done with it. But Dude, it. which one? I which had splash. You remember? Which, yeah, which splash of yours were the one that you had the hardest time or the one that you hate the most? Wait, which splash of yours or which splash of mine? No, of, of yours, not of mine. Okay, well, so for me, I was about to say I did the entire SKT group splash which at the time was like five characters and I'd never done a group splash before. So I do the whole SKT splash. And then not only do they change the outfits, but they change the champions. They were like, we're not going to do Sivir. We're going to do Callista instead. Oh, and can you add Azir? Because Easy Hoon feels left out. So I had to redo all their outfits, take out a character, replace it with another one. And then I had to squeeze in a sixth character in a splash that already had five. I promise you, I complained every day. <laughs> I was so bad to be around. Oh my god, I was I was furious. But you know, you live and learn, and in the end, it's all worth it as long as the the players like it. Oh, this is a fun question. Esben and Victor, how many languages do you know? Uh, Danish. 
German, very little. I speak like a baby in German, uh, but I do know a bit of German. Uh, so Danish, German, English. There you go. And then I speak English, French, and Spanish. And I can sort of read and understand Italian. I can guess Italian. Sometimes um, I did this Euro trip one time where we were just like driving through Europe. And back then I was really into Dragon Ball. And so I really wanted to know what was happening next in the story. So we'd go to a bookstore and sometimes I would get one in French. If we were in Spain, I'd get one in Spanish. And then one time I had to get one in Italian and I was like, oh man, like I'm not going to understand anything. But using English and French and Spanish, you can sort of deduce Italian. So I'd be like, oh, I kind of know what's going on. Plus it's Dragon Ball. I mean, it's not a narrative masterpiece, but um, yeah, so we'll, we'll say that. But yeah, I can only speak uh, French and English and Spanish. I can't speak Italian. I don't want to be a poser. Let's see. Oh wow, Esben, you're popping off, man. Do you want to I'm walk sorry. us through some of this, or are you? Um, you <laughs> yeah, I think it's. I think it. I. I think isn't it? I think it's maybe time soon. <laughs> yeah, let's like, let's talk about it. <laughs> no, you're in the zone, man. I'm, I'm sure people are loving this. Uh, uh, okay, let's 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 talk about it. Um, okay. Well, it's kind of being it's being blocked in a little bit right now. Mm. Uh, I'm just gonna add a little I, bit I of think green. People can see though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Add a little bit of green. There you go. Because Sarima has palm trees. And uh, <laughs> whenever we can get that little bit of green in here, it, yep. it just adds a lot of like lushness to the, to the piece and it will help, help with the color palette. Okay. Honestly, no joke though, dude. Like I covered this in one of the paint over streams I did at Christmas. The type of plant you include in the background does so much for the setting because yeah, a palm tree versus a pine tree versus like uh, an oak tree, that's a, you're in a completely different place in the world depending on which tree you use. So it's like super underrated detail in my opinion. Totally, totally. Um, okay, yeah, let's let's talk about it. Uh, let me just turn down some of this um, this colors just so we can just focus maybe on the line for now. Okay, so um, so the first thing, let me just turn this into a group. One sec. Okay, here we go. So, Jip, you did awesome. Uh, you're totally rocking it, and I I love that you're thinking about the the camera, and you really are. Like the way that you're pushing it kind of down, making sure that we're looking at, up at him. You know, it really shows that like you're making a deliberate choice. And you're going that extra mile in order to communicate that and also to, you know, like make that feeling present of like, this is a heroic moment and it's a big moment also for our, our hero, right? So uh, really kudos to that. Like keep, keep, keep doing that and forcing yourself into th th those challenges. That's uh, a really good thing to do. So uh, basically what I tried to do is like, I was trying to push it a little bit further, like saying like, okay, how can we, how can we take what it is that you have and then like, okay, if it's that crowning moment, it's him kind of like joining a Sears, uh, you know, um, guards uh, or like army, like kind of maybe being a higher officer or something like that. Um, then we can be like, okay, what if we are in, um, what if we are in Shurima? So I'm thinking about, okay, what does Shurima have? It's like big buildings. And then we have the sun desk here in the background. But what I'm more thinking about is like, I'm thinking about uh, also the perspective, right? So if I turn my line dry, drawing here a little bit down, so it's all about cinematography at this point. Everything in essence is gonna be a big triangle like this. And then I'm, I'm gonna frame it a little bit with having the big sun disc about around him, kind of like framing him really nicely and having that symbol of a Shurima in the back. Um, but this is going to be the, the overall composition. I'm going to try to use the platform here too to kind of like emphasize that um, sort of flow. But then everything also in the, in the character, all the ellipses here are following that sort of movement and, and push up here. So it's like even the head that we're seeing, we're seeing the underside and under plane of that pushing the ellipse again. He's holding here the mask uh, or the, the helmet that he has kind of been given. Um, 
So I'm trying to like really push the, the perspective and make that follow the camera angle that was chosen. Uh, there is a, another, uh, what's it called, vanishing point up here, which makes the, the verticals kind of like go up and kind of like do this. So my buildings are going to kind of follow that um, direction too. So then I'm going to add a bit more overlap. Um, I think there were some really cool things, but I think, you know, like you have the... One sec. There, whoop, one sec. There we go. So you have the rock here, which is like, it becomes like a foreground element. So this is going to be foreground. Then we have uh, middle ground here with the with the character, and then your background are these kind of rocks here. So, um, and what we can do is we can do something that's called stacking. So stacking is essentially uh, we add more and more things on, on top of each other. So here's a, here's a hill, behind that hill there's a hill, behind that hill there's a hill, behind, you know, like, so it's just gonna keep doing this and like they're gonna be small, they're gonna be smaller the further away they are. And all of a sudden with all these overlaps and all these stackings, it's just like, it can kind of really push us into or create a space in that sort of sense. So we have like a space here that is dragging us in. So I'm gonna try to do as much of, of this stacking uh, and overlapping as possible. So there's a overlap there, boom, overlap there, boom, here again. So I'm just like constantly trying to get that in. Um, so when we go, uh, my camera, uh, my microphone just <laughs> fell. Oh shit. Yeah. One sec, guys. Yo, Esben, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a quick potty break. You're crushing it. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me, while you do that, I'll just fix my microphone. One sec. Thank you all for for hanging out and still being here. You guys are awesome. Uh, let's fix this. Hey, that should do it. That should do it. Okay, don't don't touch the microphone, Espen. Okay, where were we? So that's essentially what I'm trying to do. Is like I'm really trying to create those stacks. So I have a foreground element. So before it was just a rock, but now we have you know the platform here, which was just a foreground before. But bef on front of that, I'm gonna add another element, right? I'm gonna like, boom, here's gonna be a foreground character. Um, and in front of that, you know, like, so it's like, it's not just one, we're gonna maybe add two because we're gonna try to create some sort of balance. Maybe this mother and her, you know, kid, they're like, maybe there's like a whole crowd that are standing here in front, kind of saluting, and it's like a celebration um, to this moment of, of a hero kind of being, being crowned. Um, in, so we have the foreground platform, we have the foreground people, then we can add another layer of story of like, who is it that he's joining, right? So if, if, the, if we're trying to tell that story of like, maybe he's joining the, 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 the royal guard in that sort of sense of Sh Shuriman, of Asir, um, then you have uh, Asir's kind of soldiers and um, army kind of standing here in the back. Um, and that's another overlap and another example of that sort of stacking. So we have the foreground, another stacking here with the those, and then behind those, you know, we have the big structure with the sun disk, and then we can have like uh, clouds in front of the sun disk and the clouds behind of the sun disk. So it's just a whole stacking fiesta. And that's how we really create that like, whoo, like depth in the scene. It's all about stacking. Um, so keep your eyes out. I love it because there, it just feels so celebratory. Like having all the people around him, not only group in terms of size, like they are almost like one character. Like instead of doing like individuals, like you made a group around him, which serves as basically one character, and they're all looking up at him. This is his moment. This is the moment he's worked so hard for. He's finally part of the royal guard, and then ev like the stars have aligned. Like he's in front of the disc. He's centered, triangular, like, and that's 
that's what leads to that feeling of celebration, right? Like, if you think about um, at the end of Star Wars, when they're giving Luke and Han Solo their medals, right? Like, you have all those people lined up, and they walk down the freaking red carpet. It, that's what it is. It's like aligning everything. All these things have come together for this moment to be important, to resonate. Oh, and so you, you, don't, yeah. you don't get that when he's alone, right? When he's alone, you're like, it makes it more of like, oh, I don't know what his story is. It's a bit turbulent. Like, is he an outsider? Like, you know, it kind of makes him feel apart. Whereas if you surround him by this community, by this culture, you understand that he's fitting into this. Like, he's defending those people. That's why they look up to him. It creates a connection. Totally. And then what we can try to do too, if we wanted to, um, you know, lean even further into um, that sort of like he, him being crowned, I think that that would be, I don't know, I would, I would consider a different choice, which would be like him maybe receiving the mask or the helmet um by another character like by a seer that would be cool because then you get to put a seer in there and you have like this sort of like you understand instantly that it's like it's a king crowning a knight in that sort of yeah. sense in that old old archetypical senses to have um that dynamic um would what would you say uh vic i was gonna say because someone in the uh someone in the chat asked if there's an example of like a downshot and uh, I think an example of the thing you're describing is like here, I'll pull it up on my on my screen is like the heartbreaker vice flash where this is exactly that moment of getting Let's knighted start. by a character off screen. And so we're looking down at her, but she doesn't feel unpowerful because of the context. Like there's uh, if you look in the background, she still like kicked everybody's ass and like won the tournament. Right. So as long as it's still this moment of celebration and power, then uh, a downshot doesn't have to feel weak, right? It's it's all about context. But this this would be sort of what you're talking about. Yep, exactly. But yeah, um, so I think I think that's like uh, that's what I would would think about when you're when you're doing that. Uh, good resources to look into if you want to go deeper into this is to read books about uh, cinematography. Uh, whenever people create movies, this is something to think about all the time of like, what is it? Where do I put my camera? What it is? How does it support the story and the dynamic of the two characters and all that? It's cinematography is super deep and can be a five hour lecture in it in its in itself. It's fascinating. It's it really it's is. so fun. It really is. Yeah. I once read a, I read a, a book, I think it's called Frame by Frame or Shot by Shot, something like that. Um, it is like a book about cinematography for movies, but you can learn a lot about the different choices um, by by kind of going into that. But there's a lot of cinematography uh, resources out there on YouTube as well. So um, definitely. I mean, a classic, right, is Frame Dink. I think you and I sort yeah. of reread that one like every year. Like it's just a masterpiece uh, for understanding that kind of stuff. But also just once you do learn about it, like go into movies with illustrator frame of mind like you go into like your favorite movie and tr and really analyze shot by shot like what's going on and why is it making you feel the way that it is i think that's the best way to learn is to have that passive artist brain going at all times totally um i saw also in the the comics this uh, in the comments this is something people have been asking a lot about if there's any tutorials out there yet um, I've done a lot of talks and they're all free, um, kind of decided to give back, uh, that way. And, you know, like, um, yeah. So if you just Google, um, you can actually find a good amount of talks that's already given, uh, last year I gave one that's called, or two years ago, I think now I gave one that's called illustrative wizardry, which kind of covers some of the fundamentals, but also some of what we're talking about today. Um, it is my plan to maybe make some more, uh, illustrations, uh, no, some more tutorials and that will be available on the online store in the future so um, if you want to get announcements of when that sort of stuff hit, uh, hits uh, please follow on, on instagram that's the first place it will come out great resource so, yeah so uh yeah we we did it man we went through yeah three o'clock exactly more or less oh wow it's we're so we're so good with time here yeah Damn. I feel like we got some good, uh, good results, good lessons. I think so too. Yeah. So, 
yeah i think that's that's uh that's gonna be it for the for the feedback we'll take two more questions so we'll go a little bit of overtime you you that can ch good. we can make one question specifically directed to vic and one direct uh, one question specifically to me and then we'll round it out um for tonight Dude, super impressive on the uh, the Shariman one. Like, what was that? Like ten minutes. You got really strong bones on that. Thanks, man. Thanks. It man. reminds me of uh, when you posted like all the Yone thumbnails. Just like you can tell that you're just sharp. You're on that. But it's like it's that di that director mindset. You know what I mean? Of like, what's the shot? Yeah, I mean, I I for me that's like one of the most fun things about drawing and creating is like the planning and when once i have the thumbnail i'm like it's fucking oh it's almost done i don't need to render yeah. it it's like <laughs> i'm the same way man like once i've solved the thumbnail i'm like that was the fun part that was the puzzle yeah now i have to do the all the hard part to make it look <laughs> man like the rendering like guys the rendering can be like we done it a lot and the rendering can still be super tough like yeah. it's a marathon and some, sometimes it like it runs smoothly, but other times it's just, uh, oof, it's a uh, heartbreaking. Um, so let's see. Okay, Vic, do you see? Uh, I'm just seeing going through here. There's a uh, one here by Ruby. Um, Victor, could you share both of your illustration and concept design experiences and the difference between them? Sure. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good question. Um, I feel like I'm someone who has sort of hopped around between a lot of disciplines in my life because when you think about it, I started out wanting to be an animator, like a 2D animator. So I did animation. Uh, then I had like a semester off and I did t-shirt design as a way to make money during the summer. So that was like more of like a graphic t-shirt style. Then I got into school, uh, started doing 3D animation, hated that. So then I switched over to illustration, did like oil painting. Um, and then eventually got on the computer, did Splash, and now I'm doing Concept. For me, it's all kind of under the same umbrella of telling stories, being creative, like understanding the puzzle or the problem space, like understanding what the constraints of the medium are. Like for a t-shirt, you can only use three or four colors and they have to be separated, right? And like that was a whole fun game. Or like for animation, it was 24 drawings per second. So it was like, I had to do a lot of gestural work and like understand movement and uh, study life. And what I found over time, right? Like through Splash and through Concept is like, they all feed into each other, right? It's more about observing the natural world or reality and communicating what you find there into your art uh, using the constraints of that medium. And so, so to, to more specifically answer your question, like Splash was really fun because it was about this one hero moment, like this one piece where everything has to be perfect, the lighting, the rendering, the story moment, the the specificity, like, and that was like really fun and challenging. Um, and I think it was a good way for me to push myself, like push my painting limits. And then concept is really fun because it's like everything I make has like fits into a larger pipeline. Like someone's then gonna model that and then it's gonna appear in a scene. So it's more about understanding what is the scene and what does this object need to be for that scene, right? It's not about like designing the best teacup of all time. It's about understanding like whose teacup is this? Like, is it damaged? Is it brand new? Is it uh, supposed to be fancy? Is it supposed to be functional, right? And so I really enjoyed that where it's like, uh, designing things based on story, which I think Splash and Concept have that in common. But the nice thing about just like doing Concept is like not everything is the main character. Like there's there's actually only one main character, right? And so learning how to design secondary characters, tertiary characters, or secondary props, tertiary props, I think is 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 fun and kind of relaxing. Because the thing about Splash is uh, I think after a while you're like you're kind of tired of making something feel so badass all the time. Cause you're like in life, there's badass moments. And then there's other types of moments. There's other emotions going on that aren't just this like super heroic, powerful thing. And so it's nice to have like a little bit of variety, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but I definitely benefit 
from all the stuff I learned painting Splash when I'm doing concept, uh, especially if I have to do like a keyframe to really sell a moment and like help the director imagine what something's going to look like. Really, really helpful to have done Splash because like that's basically our specialty is like synthesizing this moment and making it feel real. Um, so really cool having both. Um, I think I've enjoyed both and uh, we'll see what's next after that. Awesome, man. That's a super good answer. I think uh, it's it's interesting to hear like the, the, the differences between the two mindsets, but just because you can do one thing doesn't exclude the other. It might have to be at two different times in your journey, but you know, it's you you done it. You're both the concert artist and the splash artist. The journey is long. I, I get bored of stuff too. Like I kind of need to switch it up every once in a while. Um, I like to sort of jump in 110%, learn the shit out of something. And then after a, a little while, I usually get a little bit bored. And so I kind of want to do something else, move on to the next thing. But just staying creative, staying involved with stories and collaborating with amazing people like Esben and like a lot of folks at Riot. Uh, I think that's what gets me up in the morning. It's like just the energy and uh, yeah, it's just so fun. Totally. All right. Uh, can you can we find a question want, for you? Yeah. If you, if you if you don't mind, we'll do the last one. See if there's anything. Let's see if we have any specifically for you. Some of these are a little bit generic. No worries. Let's see if we can find something that has a good angle. The iPad is really helpful, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we <laughs> both have like the iPad on the side, so you. Know. Ten screens at a time. Yeah, it's so, so when like when you're drawing, you have like the screen open and seeing the chat and everything while you're drawing too, and being active active in that is like it takes a lot of energy and brain power. So having like a little iPad that you can kind of look down on um, whenever you need to check in is good. Oh my God, Jenner Chen says someone needs to make a render button. I'll yeah, pay good money for that. Same, same. Oh, this is kind of a good question. What's your favorite piece or project that you worked on and why? It's kind of a feel good question. Yeah, uh, favorite piece. Um, or, or project. Or project. I mean, recently, um, recently, it's been nice to kind of go back and kind of rediscover your own sort of taste and, and style again. Like I've been doing some of that, which has been really fun. Um, when you're doing and your comics and stuff as well. Yeah, exactly. It's been really fun. Um, but I would say within work was when I got the, the time to work on the preseason uh, illustration, which is the long illustration with tons of things going on. And it was just hilarious. It was so fun because it's like, it was like a huge puzzle. And I love that. It's like, okay, how can I just align and make all this, all these pieces support this one idea and how much shit can I stuff in there and still make it work. And that was the hard part. Uh, but it was different because splash can kind of become very repetitive and it's like, it kind of becomes a little boring after um, some time. So it's like, okay, it's a you work in a completely different format you have different things that you can tweak so i had a blast on that one and uh it's just a lot of fun now i would say doing something that's something a bit more personal i uh, can't reveal full yet but has a lot of story something as a story that's close to heart um that sort of things are those sort of things are really what matters i think also like i didn't become my dream was never to like oh i want to be a, a splash artist it's like uh, illustration always spoke to me and I wanted to master it and I think that's where my motivation lies is mastery um, I always want to kind of like learn more about it go deeper how can I tell the story like because that's really what we are in terms of like what I see our jobs to be is like we're storytellers so how can I make sure that my sword is sharp enough to be able to tell this story as most as effective as possible and communicate the feelings and the story that is supposed to be given to the viewer. Um, that's really where it is. It's, it's to communicate feeling through pictures. That's my job. Uh, and, and then splash sort of happened on the, on, on the journey, which I've been in, you know, I still are internally grateful for. It's been super, super amazing experience. 
um, but my, my main pursuit has always been mastery and, and telling stories. And I think that's the thing that kind of keeps me going. Yeah, I think you and I have that in common, honestly. It's a, it's a, I, f I feel like it's a cool responsibility, you know, like I, I take it pretty seriously. I'm like, I want to tell good stories because, I, you know, same as you, like growing up on good stories, like they have such an impact, especially on younger people. Like first time I saw uh, Princess Mononoke, like that's still with me, you know what I mean? And so I'm like, if we can do that for the next generation, that feels awesome. Totally. That's creating that sort that magic, right? Ah, well, thank you for creating some magic with me today, Victor. <laughs> this was so much fun, Asbin. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> of course, it's always it's always a pleasure and get to kind of hang out a little bit and, and give back. You're you're a great teacher and you're really good at, at explaining the mechanics of what it is that's going through your mind. And I think people uh, really, really enjoyed it. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, really appreciate all of you and and the, uh, so many of you stayed for the whole thing so yeah crazy yeah thank you thanks thanks for tuning in guys and enjoy the rest of lightbox uh make a lot of connections reach out to all your favorite artists like make the most of this time it's for you so yeah i hope you all have a good rest of your weekend yeah likewise see you ciao later <laughs> later